Fantastic. Well, I think we'll go ahead and start. Might as well get straight into it. So, Dave Gakdena, I'm Svalter of Erash Chweg on Shrak Arma What It Takes. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the UCD What It Takes Employability Series. My name is Niamh, and I'm part of the UCD Alumni Relations team. This is the first episode of our Autumn 2021 series, focusing on what it takes to excel in the hybrid workplace. We'll be hearing from two stellar UCD alumni this afternoon, Kriana Turley and Dr. Ellen Brady. First, we'll hear from Dr. Ellen Brady, Talent and Organization Strategy Manager at Accenture. With a BA in MLIT in Psychology from UCD, Ellen has also spent several years lecturing in psychology and in mental health across the UK and in Ireland. We'll then hear from Kriana Turley. With a background in workplace design and a passion for wellness in the workplace, Kriana is co-founder and CEO of international tech business Capella. Afterwards, we'll then have our 15 minutes for our audience questions. This will be led by our colleague, Michelle Cohen, who is a careers consultant with UCD Careers Network. So be sure to drop any of your questions there into the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and our speakers will then answer as many of them as possible um, at the end of the session. Finally, this session is being recorded. So if you want to revisit it, or if you're having any trouble with uh, connectivity today, you can find it on our UCD alumni YouTube channel um, starting from tomorrow. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Ellen and you can start us off. Brilliant. So thanks for the introduction, Eve. Um, I um, uh, have a background in psychology from UCD, also a PhD in medicine from Manchester, but we won't talk about that because UCD is, is kind of my main, my main connection and my main heartland. Um, so I currently work for Accenture in our talent and organisation strategy practice. And essentially what that means is I work with organisations, lots of different organisations across the public sector and the private sector um, to look at how to improve and enhance how they manage their, their organisation or how they manage their workforce. And just a quick plug, if you think that sounds like a fun job, I'd like to do that. We are actually currently recruiting at the moment for both um, our graduate programme, applications close next week and also for experienced hire roles. Um, I have my email address in the slide there. If anyone wants to talk to me about roles or about anything that we cover today, it's a topic I'm really interested in, <coughs> excuse me, really excited by and more than happy to chat about anything that, that I cover off today. Um, okay, so on to kind of the, the meat of it then. Um, what I wanted to show you was really a summary of, I suppose, some of my experiences over the last 18 months. And I think it is really important when we talk about kind of the future of work, whether we're describing that as hybrid working or whether we're describing that as flexible working. Really what we went through over the last while was not that. Um, and the pictures that you're looking at there on the screen, the one in the middle was um, my setup for, for much of my working from home practice. You can see my tiny little desk, it's crammed in between the window and my bed. Um, you can probably see my little pink headphones before I had this nice kind of call center set up. And it really was, you know, by anyone's standards, kind of a substandard work um, set up. And I think a lot of people probably had that experience, particularly in that, that March, April timeframe when we made that rapid shift to working from home. Equally then, I think for people who were going into the office, um, you know, wherever they happen to be based, whether that was, you know, a shop, whether that was a hospital, the scenes on the left and the right of the screen were very much what people were focused with, you know, empty streets, shuttered shop fronts, really this kind of uneasy, uncertain experience. Um, and a phrase that a lot of people use that I really liked over that time period was that notion of working at home and living at work. So really we saw that boundaries were so incredibly blurred. So I think when we look to the future and we look at what, um, what the workplace will be like, I think it's really important that we don't extrapolate too much basically from what came before. And I mean that from both a positive aspect and a negative aspect. So definitely when we looked at, I think those initial months of hybrid working or sorry, working from home, for a lot of organizations, productivity shot up. You know, I think we saw really low levels of absenteeism, really low levels of sick leave, really low levels of unplanned leave, essentially because no one had anyone anything else to do with work. So I think it's really important that we recognize that some of that initial productivity 
you know, it came at a huge personal cost to people. We were working because we were in our homes. We were working long hours because we didn't have anything else to do. And even though productivity and metrics might have enhanced from some perspectives, um, it's not necessarily something that was sustainable. Equally, however, I think from a negative perspective, you know, if we think about some of that loneliness, some of that isolation and um, really that lack of connection that people would have felt, I think it's also important we don't extrapolate too much of that negativity either. Um, and really, we try and take kind of what we learned over the last while and bring the best parts of the new and the old world in. Um, and I think now as kind of the dust settles and particularly for us in Ireland, um, I think at the peak of COVID, we had approximately 40% of working people working from home, which was one of the highest rates across the EU. And we were also recognised as having kind of some of the longest lockdown restrictions across Europe. So our situation was, was quite unique. And I think as the dust settles and we try and figure out what the next steps are, um, you know, it is still very much a situation that's in flux. And I think we're seeing that in two particular ways. One big thing that we've seen over the last few months, obviously, has been the Delta variant and the impact that that has had on people's return to office plans. Um, so, for example, if you think about some of the big tech companies, like, for example, Facebook, you know, they've been working towards a return to office strategy for the last few months. And really, they just had to keep shifting that out. So I think it went from... Um, August was the date for return to office, October, and now I think they're planning January 2022 return to office. So really, we're still trying to navigate our way forward and figure out what a return to the office looks like, what hybrid working looks like. Equally, then, I think from the perspective of the employee, um, I think what we're seeing is, is a really big shift or a really big, um, you know, upswing in terms of people looking for something different, looking for different roles and statistics that are coming across fairly consistently. There's a really nice report from Microsoft. There's also a really nice report from McKinsey suggests that approximately 40 percent of people are kind of actively looking for a new role and will change jobs in, in the new um, the next while. And this is being referred to as the great resignation or the great reshuffle. But I think it really reflects that idea of people looking forward and saying, you know, I don't want to do what I did before. I want to do something that's a little bit different. So we have all of these kind of different factors coming into play, you know, organizations looking to do things differently and kind of navigating their paths and um, equally workers trying to navigate their own paths and figure out what's the next step for them. And I think there is a huge variation in terms of what people need. Um, so Microsoft have done some really nice work on this. Obviously, having Microsoft Teams, they have access to a huge amount of data there. And what they find is that people increasingly want simultaneously more in-person connection pe with people, but equally, they also want more flexibility in terms of where they work. So we're seeing... Um, you know, I suppose people at the same time wanting things that directly contradict each other and directly conflict each other. Um, and one of the things that I was really struck by in some of the internal research that we did with an Accenture was one of our engagement studies, we looked at um, people returning to the office and 20% of people, when we were kind of in the height of the restrictions, wanted to be back in the office full time. And that was something that really struck me, you know, 20%, one in five of the people that we were working with, every single day, they wanted to be back in the office. So you have a huge range of different needs, different wants, different expectations that we're trying to manage. And I think essentially it all boils down to we all want the same kind of thing. You know, we want trust from our employers. We want autonomy and flexibility and to be able to work in a way that makes sense for us. We want to be able to grow our careers. We want to be able to progress our careers. We want to develop our skills. And it kind of goes without saying we want to be fairly compensated for all of that. But what that looks like varies hugely from person to person. Um, and I think a lot of the literature and the narrative and the discourse around this over the last few months kind of suggests that, you know, the organisations who get this right, they'll really be able to attract the top talent, they'll really be able to retain the top talent. But I think the big unspoken question is essentially, you know, what does getting it right looks like? And I really think at this stage, we don't totally know what that's going to be like. So now I've essentially told you we don't know what's going to happen. I'm now going to tell you what it takes to master hybrid working. So having said I don't know what hybrid working looks like, I'm now going to tell you how to do it successfully. 
Um, so absolutely happy to take any questions on this afterwards. So what I've broken it up into is um, kind of three categories of, of tips or suggestions for organizations, managers and employers. And I think it's probably important to acknowledge here that these are actually quite binary views of, of looking at things. You know, um, I think some of the, the talk, the talking points around hybrid working has kind of focused on managers and employers or sorry, employees, like they're two totally contrasting groups, you know, so managers essentially don't do any work, they just manage, employees don't do any managing, they just work. And actually, I, I think it's a lot more complex than that. Um, equally, I suppose, for organisations, you know, not everyone is necessarily going to be a decision maker within an organisation, but I think absolutely every employee plays a role in kind of creating that organisational culture. So I think that these are kind of tips that, that apply across the board. Um, up at the top there, I've included a quote from a report that I really liked from Accenture, which I think is going to appear in the, the magic of um, the chat window in a few minutes, but it's essentially just trying, I suppose, reiterating slightly more succinctly and articulately what I was trying to say on the last slide, that employees aren't the same people that they were in 2020 and neither are the organisations that employ them. So if you've seen a huge shift in terms of kind of values, missions, purpose, even I suppose kind of the products that people were developing, the business models that people operated on, have really seen a big shift over the last 18 months. And I think that's something that, that's really important to take forward to recognize that that shift has happened. Um, and that kind of comes into the, the first kind of tip that I have there, I suppose, for organizations that really when we think about hybrid working, essentially we're talking about rethinking working you know work as we knew it an organization as we knew it a business model as we knew it has really shifted hugely over the last while and i think for organizations particularly for this next kind of six to 12 month transitional period as we move into the new world i think it's really important to kind of be flexible be open take action and don't be afraid to fail fast you know one of the things i think that we've seen with covid is in the absence of information, in the absence of guidance, that's really where misinformation spreads. So I think from an organizational perspective, you know, doing something, piloting something, trying something, collecting the data on it, and not being afraid to say, look, that didn't work. Whether that's something like a two day a week policy, whether that's something like a working from home policy, whatever it happens to be, I, th I think that it's really important that we kind of restructure that. Um, a huge part of that, like I said, is, is that data piece. And I do think in the same way that the way we think about productivity has shifted slightly, um, it is potentially important to kind of rethink the typical metrics that we would have looked at beforehand and equally potentially spend a little bit of time um, kind of unlearning some of those bad behaviours that might have crept in over COVID. And by bad behaviours, I mean things like potentially significant overtime and um, underutilisation of annual leave, things like that, that kind of became a little bit of a habit for some of us to really look at that from an organisational perspective. Kind of alongside that, I think it's important to consider what are the formal structures you need to put in place for any kind of changes that you're making. So if you're thinking about hybrid working where some people are at home and some people are in the office, what are the formal structures that you maybe need to put in place to, um, to recreate some of the in-office interactions? So for example, things like open door sessions, um, you know, doing video content from leaders, things that wouldn't necessarily have been in place in the old world, but actually are really key maybe to creating that sense of kind of virtual connectivity and reminding people that they're part of the same organization. And the next thing that I think is really important to bear in mind is to trust your people, listen to them and keep listening. Um, I think, you know, the situation that we're going to go through over the next few months, there's going to be an awful lot of change that's going to happen. We're going to be trying new ways of working. We're going to be trying out new things. And I suppose from a leadership perspective, I'd really just emphasize, you know, remember what your workforce went through over the last 18 months. Remember how quickly they were able to shift and pivot and continue to deliver. And I suppose just trust that they will continue to do the same thing um, as we move into this, this new way of working, as we move into whichever um, kind of delivery model that you look to do. 
listening I think goes alongside that and um, so really listen to the needs the views and experiences of your people and again that might mean collecting data in a way that you haven't done before you know maybe it's doing more often employee engagement surveys maybe it's looking at something like your exit interviews say and, and really looking at how you capture that kind of data and then you act on it um, but ensuring that it kind of continues to be a two-way process and you're collecting feedback from your people to say, you know, how is this going? How is this working for you? Um, my last tip then, I think, from an organisational perspective, again, kind of comes back to that data point. So really, really scrutinise your data, you know, and look at it from as many lenses as possible. So to give you an example, supposing as part of your hybrid working policy, as part of your return to office policy, you decide to implement, say, a four day week work week, you know, and people can opt in for this, they sign up for this, it's at 80% pay. It might be hugely successful. You might have a really strong uptake rate and um, employee engagement might go right up. You might equally get some really nice positive press around it. And that's fantastic. But think about what happens then, you know, in two years time, five years time, look at it from all different angles. So maybe employee engagement is great, but actually what's happening from a retention perspective or potentially, I think more worryingly, what's happening from a progression perspective. So the people that you're moving on to a four day week, are they progressing through your organization at the same rate? And if not, why not? You know, have you readjusted, say, your performance metrics? Have you readjusted your performance management structures to encompass the fact that people are on a four day week? And, um, you know, think about it from your inclusion and diversity lens. Is it potentially the fact that a lot of women are opting in for your four day week policy? And is this then going to impact the gender balance on, say, some of your senior leadership teams? So really look at things from kind of as many different lenses as you can. And I suppose or understand kind of the impact, but also the organizational structures that you need to have in place um, in order to facilitate whatever approach that you're looking at. Um, in terms then of the tips for managers, I suppose, like I said, this is a fairly binary category. And I think anyone who's within an organization, they, these will still apply. But I think the first one is definitely to get to know your team, particularly from a hybrids perspective where we potentially have people scattered across different places. Um, it's really important that you develop those kind of relationships where you know people, you understand where they're coming from, not necessarily, you know, to be best friends with everyone, but I think if you have a sense of who someone is inside and outside of work, that goes a really long way. Um, one of the other hats that I wear in work is um, I would do a lot of work in terms of workplace wellness and mental health in the workplace. And we would often say um, the first sign that someone is struggling is that they're not themselves. So the more you know the people around you, you know, are they particularly vocal in meetings? Are they particularly introverted? What kind of ways do they like to work? The easier it's going to be for you to understand and have a conversation around any shifts in their behavior. And the next thing that I would say, you know, for anyone, whether that's that's middle management and above equally, like I said, if, if you're just a team member working with your team, uh, lead by example, you know, do what you would want to be done to you, be respectful of other people's boundaries. If you've come up with kind of agreed ways of working, so say, you know, we only schedule meetings between core hours, really kind of stick to that um, and be as open and transparent with your team as, as you can be. And that kind of links to that last point there, I suppose, you know, as a manager, you might be under particular pressures to to operate in a particular way. And I think where you can, you know, be open with your team about those business objectives and about those commercial goals. A lot of what we're talking about today um, is kind of situated around what people need for an organization, which is, of course, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is going to be what organizations need from their people. So be open where there are particular commercial drivers. So to give you some examples, it might be that, say, over a particular time period, sales is really key. You know, there might be particular goals, particular targets that you need to hit. So you might say to your team, look, over the next six weeks, you know, we're looking at a really intense period of work. So as a result of that, you know, maybe we'll all work from home a little bit more. 
Um, equally, it might be a case that you say, look, we have a few new joiners coming into the team. I know our normal working patterns are this, you know, we're at home these days or we work remotely these days. Actually, for a two week period, because we have these new joiners and we want to create the sense of organizational culture, we want to make them feel welcomed. We're actually going to do a bit more in the office. And just be open about what the drivers are for, for particular structures, rather than just kind of saying to people without that context, this is what we're, we're looking to do. Finally, then, in terms of tips for employees, um, I think, like I said, we're going to see a real period of shift and transition over the next few weeks, months and, and possibly years. And I think, you know, where possible, try and make that fluidity work for you. I think particularly if you're new to an organization, um, there will be a lot of, you know, opportunities for improvement, essentially. And I think it is a really good way to, to be able to put your hand up and say, look, can we try this? Can we do this? I've thought of this idea. I've thought of a way that we can implement it. I think it can really work for our team. I think it can really work for our organization as a whole. Can we give it a go? So try and make that fluidity where possible work for you. The other point that I think that's quite related to that is take the time to understand what it is you need and make sure you ask for it. So no one is going to be a mind reader. And in the same way that I spoke about from an organizational perspective, you know, you might need to have in place things like open doors to replace some of that informal networking. Equally, understanding what you need as a worker, maybe you need really direct feedback. Maybe you like to do 10 minutes of brainstorming with your manager before you progress with the project. Whatever it happens to be, understand what you need to succeed in the workplace um, and ask for that from the people around you. Finally, this is a little bit cheesy, but this is something that we really try and stick to on, on my own team in Accenture. Um, feedback is a gift. You know, learning from the people around you, learning how to grow and develop and progress your career, I think, is, is something that's really, really important. Um, so just be as open to receiving feedback as possible. And equally, if your organizational structures, if your performance management structures aren't necessarily centered around feedback, you know, take the initiative to look for it. Again, this is the kind of thing we might have taken for granted back in the old world. You know, you might give a presentation, you walk out of the room and someone might make a brief comment to you, you know, that was great, that was really good. I actually had a follow-up question on this. You might not necessarily get that in the hybrid world. So try where possible to kind of chase that information as much as you can. Um, okay, brilliant. That is everything from me. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I know we will hopefully have lots of time for the Q and A's afterwards and um, so I'll pass over to you Neve. is that right? Thanks Alan and um, we'll jump over to Karina now if you're ready Karina. I sure am, how are you? I'm just sharing my screen with you if that's okay. Now yeah, that should be working all right there. Um, so hello my name is Karina Turley and I run a company called Capella and we are specialists in kind of the practical side of, of hybrid working and um, so you've heard from the doctor um, and uh, now you're going to hear from me, if you can bear with me. Uh, hopefully I can give you uh, a few practical tips as well to come in behind what Ellen uh, was saying there. Um, the first thing I wanted to do, though, was to give you a kind of a, a quick synopsis of my last 18 months and how um, how COVID affected me and how my career uh, has developed and changed. and. Uh, um, how hybrid working has come into my life. So my life before COVID, I was running a, a business that specialised in um, beautiful office design, work, workplace design and employee engagement. Um, so I really uh, was really, really enjoying that. But I had made the decision that I was going to step away from being the managing director of that business and replace myself um, and just concentrate really on internationalizing the business and growing it because I felt there was huge potential in um, offices. <laughs> um, so I was in Canada uh, with Enterprise Ireland in March 2020. We had identified a couple of businesses that we wanted to talk to and um, to see if we could acquire them um, in order to internationalize the, the business. And I came home to my hotel room um, on a Wednesday night uh, and there were a couple more meetings the next day in the Enterprise Ireland offices. And uh, I sat down on the bed and, and, and Trump was on the television saying he was going to close the borders and 
Uh, Toronto had had SARS uh, uh, 20 years previously, so they were taking it really seriously. And the EI um, offices, I, I got a call from, from uh, one of the people in Edwards, Ireland saying they closed the offices. And I had another week in, in Toronto, um, but I, a note was pushed under my door saying, um, you know, all the restaurants in the hotel are, are closed, you'll get your food in your room kind of thing. And I got the fright of my life. I realized that um, things had changed. Um, I, I didn't know anyone in Toronto. I said about trying to get back to Ireland. And I got on one of the last planes back to Ireland um, around St. Patrick's Day of, of, um, of 2020. And I suppose um, the, the next picture is of me uh, with the kids homeschooling and um, uh, children are absolutely a blessing. But if you look at my face there, that's, that, that's a pretty kind of stressed looking face for me. So I knew that I, I had uh, extracted myself from, from the position of running the last business. I was looking at an internationalization role and I had, the world was at my feet and suddenly I knew that the budgets were gone for what we were doing. And I had to kind of decide, okay, well, what's my next move at 46 years of age? Um, and what I did is I took a deep breath and I started listening to webinars and thinking and really thinking about where opportunity would come in this crisis. And I sat down and I thought, well, how can I support the, the customers that I've been working with for the last 20 uh, years? And, and really, I thought, well, if they're not going to be spending money on, on the beautiful office spaces, why don't I take all of my learning around um, workplaces and, and ergonomics and health and safety and design and put it into a remote solution for employers? So again, uh, at 46 years of age, I got involved in technology for the first time uh, in my life, uh, in, a, in my professional life. And I, um, I joined forces with a really, really clever technologist. And I, I really felt like I had unfinished business with the whole internationalization piece. So I convinced um, uh, a woman who is now my co-founder and who's based in Manhattan to join me on this journey and to quit her job and come along and, and start Capella with me. Um, and we also have a really talented uh, project manager in the early days. So the, the four of us set off on this journey and we built um, a solution around making sure that employees were set up right while they were working from home. So very much what Ellen was talking about there, where, where people kind of just landed at the kitchen table or, or on a bed. Um, we came in behind companies to, to address the kind of the health and safety law side of it, but also to, to address the wellness of the employee working from home and the physical side of the employee working from home. And we um, developed a, an online tool to do that. Um, and every day I tried to learn, every, every day I, I tried to um, think about how my journey uh, was going to start again and what I could bring uh, to that journey. Now, uh, we have a platform for hybrid working. We have software to, for people to book um, back into the, into the office, book time at home, share their hybrid schedules with their colleagues, so collaboration and that kind of thing. And we have uh, offices in Dublin and New York, uh, clients in the UK, Portugal, Luxembourg and the US, which we would never have had kind of in the old company. And um, I'm learning about technology all the time um, and, and it's fascinating. It's really, really an exciting space to be in. Um, so I guess now I'm going to just turn to what, what we're finding as we work with companies on their hybrid working uh, policies, on bringing technology solutions to hybrid working for them. Um, and a question that it, it kind of stumps me when I'm, when I'm asked, but I am still being asked quite often, is, is, is hybrid working a thing? So people within organizations are saying, you know, is this going to stay? Are we going to are we going to do all this planning and put in all this software and then find that we want people back in the office and people want to be back in the office? And I guess all of the research and, and a lot of what Ellen was, was talking about there in terms of statistics is around the fact that, that things have changed and employees have more kind of, I suppose, power um, now than, than ever before. Um, and so... Uh, Really, um, it's about the next few months of, of, of planning and, and experimenting around what hybrid working will look like for different companies. So, 
suddenly last year, everyone one week went remote and, and slowly different companies started bringing people back in and trying things. But what we're seeing in the, in the statistics now is that um, most people would like that kind of flexible hybrid um, working uh, going into the future. And what that looks like is going to be different for different organizations and different people. Um, and the policies are being set at the moment. So companies really, they need to consider um, a much larger hybrid workforce and the challenges that uh, arise around that. And the future of, of, of the workplace is unfolding. Do we need as much space? Can we, can we spend the next few months just seeing how people interact with the actual workplace and see if actually we could hand back the lease on one floor of this building? Or, or we can use more collaborative spaces because people are coming into the office specifically to focus uh, or, or to collaborate with each other. They're coming into the office for a purpose. Uh, if, if it's a normal workday, they can absolutely do that from home. So gathering that data and using technology to give you that information to make proper decisions based on data rather than gut feeling. That's what the next few months um, are very much going to be about in terms of what we're seeing. Um, so the direction is being set at the moment. A lot of companies are working on their policies. And I suppose another thing that we're seeing is, is good intentions. There are no companies who've said to me, I don't care. I just want everyone back. How are we going to do this? Most companies, most, uh, as Ellen said, most uh, employers or managers are also employees and they want to get this right for their colleagues. So what I would say to people who are looking at returning into a hybrid working uh, environment is find a way to have your say, get your voice heard as these policies are being uh, created at the moment and um, approach the team, approach the, the stakeholders in the policy uh, setting and, and have that conversation. Um, and look to yourself as well, like now is the perfect time to, to press reset and say, do I need to upskill? Do, is there an area that, uh, you know, I, I need to develop my own skills in? And for a lot of people, that's going to be technology. And, and there's no harm in, in saying, look, I, I want to be a, a proper onboarding process for the technology that's being delivered into the company. You know, if, if you don't want to be very public about it, then there's on-demand training, uh, recorded training that you can do in your own time. And a lot of companies are considering putting far more training um, uh, into, the, into the narrative around hybrid working. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is, it's definitely going to be different, but I, I would say for both employers and employees, Give it a chance uh, do your best. Don't do anything dramatic and irreversible. Just do your best to learn through this process um, and to try and understand what, what works for the organization and what works for the staff. And then just, I suppose the guys were, when we were speaking uh, offline about this, we were talking about how uh, we could kind of bring some practical tips to people who are about to return to hybrid working um, for the first time in maybe 18 months. And, and what can we suggest in how to make hard working just work better? Um, and the first step I'd say is to repl uh, replicate your, your office at home. So, you know, don't sit on the bed. Uh, kitchen chairs aren't designed to sit on for um, eight hours. Uh, I don't know of any meal that lasts eight hours, maybe in France. Um, but what you probably need to do is get a proper chair, okay? And you can get them from anything from 100 euro upwards. So that's an investment uh, you should make. And if you kind of landed at the kitchen table or you landed in a bedroom um, 18 months ago, now's the time to review that. So in all of our um, employee risk assessments that we've done in Capella over the last 18 months, We've seen, we've seen someone working in a wardrobe. We've seen someone working in, in their car uh, every day. We've seen people working in beds and utility rooms. Um, so as what was temporary and what was kind of an emergency measure turns into a, a more permanent um, uh, solution around hybrid working, so too should your attitude to your workspace. You would never put someone in a, um, in a bed in the office. So you need to think for yourself, what is, what is a suitable workspace? And have a look around your home to try and make sure that you're dedicating the right space to working from home. 
Um, I would say invest in technology to make your life easier. Uh, so if you've been holding off on, on things like uh, requesting a lightweight laptop or, or external storage, now's the time uh, as the policies are being set and the budgets are being put in place to have those conversations. And then a bit of fun, get the gadgets, get the wireless headphones. Uh, Christmas is coming. Get yourself a gorgeous laptop bag so that, so that it is a positive thing, this hybrid working in and out of the office. Um, one that I'm really struggling with is, is going paperless um, because I, I love a bit of paper and I love a pen, but I've always left it back in the office when I'm at home and vice versa. So get your documents up into the cloud and, and try to go paperless as much as you possibly can. Um, and then automate transparency. So, so what you really need to do if you're trying to collaborate with people is to automate or use technology to make sure that you're sharing your schedules as much as possible. So you know that when you turn up on a Thursday uh, to work with Ellen on a, on a project, that she's not at home that day if you want to do a face-to-face -face meeting. And um, so as an organization, I would certainly look at some of the tools that are out there. There's some amazing uh, innovation uh, at the moment uh, uh, around collaboration, communication, um, booking, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. So I would certainly uh, look at technology and, and try to make it as easy as possible uh, for people to function in the hybrid workspace. So that's it from me. They're my practical tips. Um, I will hand it back to, uh, to you, Eve, if that's okay. Um. Hi, Neve. I'll, I'll jump in now. Uh, so um, thanks very much, uh, Karina and, and Ellen, for brilliant presentations. Um, so interesting to hear about this topic. And uh, we have some questions that have, have come in and I think uh, kind of demonstrates the, the breadth of our audience uh, because we have obviously current students and MBAs who are curious about the future of work. They're joining a workforce that look it's going to look different to anything they imagined when they first joined university. Um, and then we've all our colleagues around the university uh, curious about what hybrid working means. And then, of course, lots of our uh, alumni who are recent graduates, um, but also in kind of mid and senior level roles who are curious about what hybrid working means for, for them and, and their organisations and, and their own roles. So I will uh, I'll jump into some of these now because they're actually really, really interesting. Um, I suppose just firstly around, uh, Karini, you mentioned um, just about the cost saving. So your experience maybe of where organisations are looking at, gosh, we could, we could reduce the, the space that we rent. But I suppose interesting, someone is asking, like, is there actually, is there really a reduced cost in terms of, is there an investment then on the other side from in technology? Um, and do you have any thoughts on that? Like, um, I suppose just if people have to move funds, but to another place where they're looking at uh, a lot more investment in technology and, and communications. Um, yeah, it's funny because I've moved from the physical space into technology. Um, and I think um, technology represents very good value. Uh, I would say that. But, you know, if you're if you're looking around um, it, it, you don't necessarily, it isn't a huge capital outlay uh, initially, a lot of it would be a, a recurring fee and that certainly builds up over the time, but uh, you can establish whether you're getting value out of it uh, quite quickly. In terms of the actual office space, the office isn't dead and we're, we're still often asked to review the use of the office space um, and in some of the visuals that you would have seen there, we still use industrial designers and 3D, 3D uh, visuals in everything we do um, as part of a user experience because people really like the, that, that kind of thing. But in terms of offices, what we're seeing is um, hot desking is a really strong trend. And the reason people are using this is to release more of the collaborative spaces and not to have desks sitting there when someone's only coming in two days a week. So managing that is, uh, is very, very easy um, um, with, a, with, a, with the software, like the software that we have that we were talking about. Um, and then at that point, you can take the data from that and, and you can say, okay, well, maybe I, maybe I have a lease here and I can't hand back a, a, a floor of the building, but I don't have to clean that floor. And I can push people into, in a positive way, positively disrupt them into to going into this area and, and, and really learn about the use of the workplace and space. 
and and then you can develop your your policies around that and there are certainly significant significant cost savings around that piece and a lot of the facilities staff and operation staff who might be listening today the, there's a lot of pressure on them to get this right um and and to save on on desk space there's a there's a cost per desk in their budgets you know so it's it's really interesting and they actually have a chance of making change here now brilliant thank you very much um, and Alan, for you, um, a, 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 a audience member has asked a question just around, you had mentioned about knowing your team um, and their individual maybe requirements. And uh, it, it looks like somebody is even thinking ahead at that and looking to offer individual, individualized hybrid work experiences for their team members based on what they know about their work styles and personalities and, and responsibilities. But I suppose their question is, do you think that's maybe over ambitious? Uh, too idealistic? Is it the right thing to do? I, I think the more that people understand about themselves and their own needs and perspectives, the, the better, the easier it's going to be for them to communicate that within the organisation and the easier it's going to be for a manager to adapt to that. And I think there's lots of different lenses to it. You know, some of it will just be kind of the practical day to day. You know, these are the supports that I need to help me do my job. Equally, there's the career progression lens to it. You know, if you're looking towards promotion, if you're looking towards say a lateral move within the organisation, if there's particular um, learning and development objectives that you set for yourself or that you'd like to set for yourself I think that kind of individualized understanding is is really um really important one thing I'm suppose I'm noticing in the, the questions is something that I think Korea and I both touched on which is that tension I suppose sometimes between what an organization wants versus what an employer works wants and I think in the same way that you know there's a cohort of people who love working from home there's a cohort of people who hate working from home and there's something that has to happen in the middle equally i think there's going to be something um, you know there, there's kind of a happy medium that has to be come up with and I, a few people had asked questions around kind of um facilities tax breaks things like that the way I'd be looking at it with the lens is, well, what is your employee value proposition? You know, what are you offering for employees? And I think people who can clearly communicate what that employee value proposition is, what that entails, what an employee will get. I think they're the ones who'll be ahead of the game because there will be a clearer marriage then between the employee and the employer. You know, the employer employer is being upfront in terms of saying, come to us, we do X, Y and Z. X, Y, and Z might be that you're fully at home. X, Y, and Z might be that you're fully remote. But the clearer and the more transparent that we can be around that, I think the, the easier um, the transition is going to be. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Karina, a question for you. Um, are there reservations from employees around that collaborative working space, like in practice? So that move from I have my own desk and chair, this is my space, um, and then moving that moving into a more collaborative shared space. Are there is there anything you would recommend in, in terms of alleviating those fears? Um, I suppose it's a, a cultural shift. Yeah, it is. And, it, you know, anytime we used to do a, a big office design in, in the past, someone would be bent out of shape because they really liked being in that desk. And I suppose, you know, different personalities that it's as it's as important for the person uh, who used to like that desk as it is for the manager who wants the new office. And, uh, you know, you just manage people's um, expectations and, and people's anxieties and desires. And, um, you know, it, it is part of the future of working. It's probably the biggest trend that we're seeing. Um, so it's really about, uh, as Ellen would say, you know, communicating uh, with your staff, uh, understanding when they are experiencing some, some anxiety about it and, and dealing with it and, and saying, OK, you know, there is a cleaning schedule in place. This will allow us to automate that, you know, and, and trying to look at the positives of it and then asking them to try it. Okay, very good. Um, there's some, I suppose, uh, rumoured tax breaks coming in, um, which I suppose are designed maybe to, I suppose, at least begin the conversation and encourage uh, people uh, to support people working from home. Um, have you any kind of sense, are they adequate? Is there more, a lot more to be done or are they a great starting point? I, I guess, Alan, maybe I might... Uh, yeah, to be honest, don't know enough about the ins and outs to, to be able to comment properly. I was hoping you're going to throw that over to Karina, but maybe she doesn't either. 
Um, I know that um, it, I, I've, I've heard that there's stuff coming as well. Um, I know that employers at the moment don't have to specifically buy equipment for staff who are working from home under the law, but a lot of employments are employers are buying that. I'd like to see something uh, around that. So making sure that the people are set up um, right while they're working from home. I, I, I'd like to see that in, in some of the stuff that's coming, but hopefully it will. Very good. Um, I think there's a sense from all the, the questions that are coming in, there's just a lot of um, flux and, and there's a desire to get it right. <laughs> um, so the questions are quite, what is your advice on? And uh, so it sounds like people are, are looking for more direction, whereas I guess the message from you guys is that constant, maybe flexible approach and that communication and that creating that, that culture. Um, are there just, and this is maybe just to both of you, um, we would see the, the tech sector obviously quite agile in this space, but are you aware of other sectors that maybe you feel are, are maybe leading in this in this space, in that hybrid market, or is it too early to say yet? I think it's a little bit too early to say, like definitely for me, some of the, the organisations or the sectors that I have been really impressed with are the ones who had, you know, some of the kind of remote working hubs in Skibbereen and places like that, where they already had that kind of infrastructure set up um, where the broadband was already in place. I think there's lots of really exciting stuff that that's happening there. But I, to be honest, I think that everyone is, is struggling with it to the same extent. Um, and to a certain extent, I think when an organization is very large, it makes it harder for them to be agile. And I think it's some of the um, SMEs who will do really exciting things over the next while, you know, where they're, they're able to get themselves set up with, you know, some fancy software, Karina. You know, they're able to make decisions quickly. They're able to flex and adapt to the needs of their staff. So I think we'll see some lovely um, case studies coming out there over the next few months. Yeah, it's really funny, actually. You just stole exactly what I was going to say there. And um, um, SMEs are, are, you know, the, it, it's just much easier to get a, a decision through um, without a, a big board or a large organisation of different stakeholders having to decide. So some of the F SMEs that we've worked with are, are very progressive, really progressive, and are doing are doing very well in this area. Okay, very good. Um, and maybe just a, a question just from the, something we were talking about in, in the Queers Network with my own colleagues and my colleagues in, in Smurfit was around the maybe some apprehension in current students who are preparing for the workplace in terms of how maybe how they build a network, how they kind of, I suppose, get involved in the culture if they're working quite remotely and maybe, you know, in one or two days. Um, any, would you have any suggestions that, you know, for current students preparing for the workplace? I know you mentioned the flexibility, resilience, that constant communication, and it probably comes back to knowing a little bit about themselves. Um, but if you have any, any tips, that would be helpful. I think I would say, you know, really take advantages of any opportunities that are offered in the same way if you were in the workplace, you know, an email might go around to say, you know, there's networking drinks on a Thursday evening and you might think, oh God, the last thing I want to do is go to networking drinks or go along to this lunch, but invariably you will connect with someone. Um, so take advantages of what, what's offered. If there is, say, a leadership open door series, go along to that. You might feel a bit awkward and you might not have a huge amount, you feel like you have a huge amount to say, but really just, just try it. Um, and what I would think is kind of underpinning all of that is this experience, stressful and complex and, and in flux as it is, this is the work of the future. So the skills that you are developing by virtue of being a graduate who's trying to navigate this new world, those skills will stand to you forever. You know, I think a lot of the questions that we're getting in the chat there are from people who are saying, look, I'm a manager and I need to do this. As a grad navigating this, you're starting to develop those managerial skills, you know, when you're starting to understand how you navigate this workspace, how other people navigate this workspace, but essentially take advantage, but just remind yourself how much you're learning on a daily basis. And this is actually part of your growth and progression, as painful as it might feel at times. I think mm -hmm. I'd just like to jump in there and say as well, from a kind of a, from a health and safety point of view and from a mental health point of view, some of the stuff that we saw in terms of the assessments um, um, of people's home workspace, because we see we see a visual of it, 
um, for people who are just starting out their career, they they don't they don't know you don't know what's right and what's acceptable. But if you're doing your best and and you feel isolated and you feel uh, alone and you know you're in a bedroom where you're sleeping all night, you're getting up to have some breakfast, you're going back to the bedroom to work all day, you're watching a movie and you're going back to bed again after Guardians of the Galaxy, and um, you know I would know. Uh, at 47 now, um, that that's not right. But as you start your career, it's very hard to know if you started in this, what's right and wrong. So just, just listen to yourself, watch your mental health, make sure you're talking to friends, make sure you're, you're staying in touch with family. And, and if something does feel wrong or it's getting out of control, talk to someone and, and, and find a way to, to get yourself a better environment. That might be going back into, into the office or going into a company's workspace. That's perfectly acceptable. There's a lot of people who are accommodation sharing and, and they, you know, it's not suitable. They've drawn the, the, the short straw and they're in the bedroom all day. But talk to your manager about going into the office and working from there. Just, just watch your mental health around this. Yeah, no, it's a very, very important message. Um, well, I'm just, I'm conscious of time because I, I can see in the messages people are, are beginning to jump off because they're uh, obviously getting back to, they're on their, their lunch hour. Um, but I suppose maybe just to say thank you both very, very much. I know myself even I'm going to watch this recording because there was so much uh, useful uh, information um, and it was really, really great and really appreciate your, your time. Um, so I'll hand back to Neve. I know she wants to, to say a few things. Thanks a million, Michelle. Um, yeah, thanks, Michelle, for steering those audience questions. They were fantastic. It was, it was really, really great chat. And thank you so much to Ellen and Kriana for those fantastic presentations. Um, it was just, it was a great chat all together. Um, just a few things before we go. Um, remember, if you are a student or if you've graduated from UCD in the past two years, you can take advantage of the many events and consultant advice from the UCD Careers Network. So we're going to pop that in the chat there now. And thanks to all of you who tuned in this afternoon and um, you can connect with Kriana and Ellen on LinkedIn after this session so the links to their profiles are going to be posted there in the chat as well and um, you can also find the slides from today's presentations as well as numerous other resources in the what it takes resource hub on the UCD alumni network and that link will be put in the chat also as well so keep an eye on the chat for those links um, and then just a few other final notes on upcoming events before we wrap up this afternoon you might also be interested in our next What It Takes webinar, um, What It Takes to Thrive in Global Teams, happening on Wednesday the 20th of October at the new time of 6pm, so it'll be later. Um, you can sign up for this and check out the rest of the series at the link in the chat as well. Finally, this series aims to support our UCD community with career development opportunities, but I'd also like to mention our commitment to supporting our students through the COVID crisis. Uh, generous funds have been raised uh, thanks to our alumni and friends of UCD like you. Um, if you'd like to support our efforts to provide urgent, and uh, urgent financial and mental health support to those students who need it most, you can visit the link in the chat there as well. So that's all from us. Thanks so much for joining us again this afternoon and hopefully we'll see you again next time. Take care. <laughs>